welcome everyone. Um, hello from Southern California and around the world. And thank you for being a part of today's Globinar on attracting international investment in FDI. I'm Kuntal Shah Warwick, Global Advisor at Global Chamber San Diego and Principal at KSW Consulting. Um, from San Diego and from the headquarters team, I welcome you. And uh, so before we get into the discussion, um, I just want to make sure that everybody can hear us. I think um, I, I know one of our participants or attendees may be having some issues uh, connecting. That's the message I'm getting. So Cesar, maybe you can just uh, take a look into that. Um, but but before we get into the discussion, I just um, you know also want to make sure that uh, uh, you all know that you can use the chat function if there are any questions or any issues. So today we're joined by a really dynamic group of presenters who are involved in economic development of their regions through attracting FDI in various ways. So just to give a very brief introduction, with us is um, Matt Belcher, CEO of the San Diego EB-5 Regional Center here in San Diego, uh, Christine Berrigan from the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, uh, joining us from Chicago. Jagat Shah, who is uh, with the Global Network India and Global Chamber Ahmedabad, and joining us from Ahmedabad, Gujarat. Um, James Cummings is with London and Partners uh, here from Los Angeles. And uh, hopefully joining us soon will be Cesar uh, Peñaranda from Pro Inversion Peru. Um, so with that, what we'll be doing today is we'll discuss the economic priorities of each region how they've decided to pursue foreign direct investment, if and how they've integrated uh, public and private efforts, and which industries are the most compelling moving forward for FDI. So just, uh, just a very quick crunch of numbers. Um, according to the FDI report from the Financial Times in 2017, um, th this is just a very broad overview of what's happened in the world uh, last year. The U.S., of course, uh, is in, I shouldn't say of course, but it, it is in the top spot in terms of uh, inflow of FDI um, with $87.4 billion. Um, FDI into Western Europe increased by 4% by the number of projects and 13% by capital investment. Uh, FDI into the U.K. is slightly lower. Uh, than what it has been, but I think that's probably not a you know a big surprise to to a lot of people. But I'm sure James will help put you know some perspective on that. Um, China regained its uh, a top spot in the Asia Pacific region, uh, accounting for 26% of capital investment. And interestingly enough, Poland continues to rise as a key destination for FDI with the number of projects increasing 25% and capital investment increasing 49%. I'm sorry, 49%. So with that, that just kind of gives a very broad snapshot, but it'll be nice to get into some specific areas with our presenters today. Um, I should mention also that the conversation began with our member uh, San Diego EB-5 Regional Center and an uh, event that they're organizing the Global Investment Forum in mid-September. Um, so we're so happy to have that be the impetus for this conversation. And so with that, I'd like to turn the screen over to Matt um, to tell us a little bit about what's happening in San Diego and um, how it's gr uh, rapidly drawing global attention. Thank you, Kuntal. And uh, thank you for having uh... Thank you for having me on this call this, uh, today with everybody in the group. I really appreciate it. We, um, obviously you can hear from my, my accent, I'm not from the United States. So I've, I've been through the process of uh, you know, moving countries several times actually. And I, I've gone through the green card process. And that's one of the reasons we created San Diego EB5 Regional Center. We also have another one in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and we're establishing one in Hawaii. So between those regional centers, we have about $1.3 billion worth of real estate projects currently underway and more to come. And that's a great 
uh, the EB-5 visa program is a great mechanism to help people that want to come to the United States. But it's one slice of what you're talking about, which is foreign direct investment. And that's really the focus of what the event is uh, in September, uh, which is the uh, Global Investment Forum, September 20th. Um, for those that are coming from out of town, there's actually a, uh, a welcome event on the 19th, but the actual main event is the 20th. And what we realized is, is that a lot of people um, want to know more about Southern California in particular, uh, but not, not just vertically. So there's a lot of events that are you know, biotech or tech or manufacturing or real estate or finance. It's very rare that you see something that's across all of those uh, industries and not just the things like um, the main business I'm involved in, which is the visa investment. So... This is just people who, you know, when I'm traveling in India or when I've been in uh, Mexico, uh, Europe, you know, other places, uh, a lot of people say, yeah, we're really interested to invest our money, our time, maybe expand our business into that area. We just uh, don't know very much about it. And that's really what this, the Global Investment Forum is about. It's, it's a day, fully packed day where we're having multiple um, industries and um, uh, uh, businesses and individuals that are dedicated to uh, uh, promoting Southern California. So everything from real estate to biotech to tech to um, AI, uh, financing, alternative financing such as Regulation A plus Tier 2 and some other of those mechanisms, ICOs, blockchain, we have, we have it all. Um, so that's, I'm part of that. Uh, there's a whole group of us that have put that together and, um, and um, you know, we're, we're excited to see, we're probably going to have about 200 or so people turning up to that event with 40 speakers. So it's becoming a, it's becoming a really good event. Matt, very, I'm sorry, Matt, very quickly, can you sure. also um, help frame how, the regional center is connected to um, the impact on FDI in San Diego and what role uh, your organization plays and, and really sort of what the big picture is of um, both the forum and the center's impact on FDI in the region. Sure. Um, yeah, so we created the regional center to help economic impact and that the program is designed to uh you know allow foreign investors to invest currently five hundred thousand uh, dollars into a project we pull those together so we may get 10 20 30 investors into one project and our focus is very much about capital improvement projects uh, public private partnerships uh, our regional center, we actually have a five-year contract with the city of San Diego. So we, we, were, we were selected by them to be their partner regional center. Uh, so we're this quasi-government, public, private entity. Mm -hmm. And we're funding projects that actually have a real impact in the community. So we, we are involved in some individual projects, such as hotels and assisted living, but we're really looking at infrastructure type projects, things that are uh, perhaps building a new toll road, a new bridge, uh, um, water treatment plants, renewable energy, that type of thing. So we're using foreign investment to better the uh, local and the, the greater San Diego, Southern California community. Um, and that's what the forum is about too. You know, it, it, it's not an EB-5 forum. It is a international foreign investment forum. Uh, in, in all, all aspects of that. And uh, just to kind of dig a little bit deeper, um, are most of the uh, projects that you're seeing and that you're uh, contracted um, to carry out, are they primarily brick and mortar or are there other areas that you're looking for, um, you know, particularly with regard to the EB-5 center, but, um, mm -hmm. you know, what, what kinds of projects are you seeing in this region? Mm -hmm. What are you looking to attract? And I, I'm imagining some of those obviously will be um, a focus of conversation during the forum, but, but give us an idea of the types of projects you're really looking to attract. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, Kunta. 
So um, primarily in EB5, we look at real estate projects. And I won't go too much into the detail of, of why, but uh, the, the easy way to explain it is that for the EB5 investor, uh, we need a way to collateralize their investment. And so obviously real estate brings that. Now, that doesn't mean uh, that you can't use EB5 for other things. And indeed, it's been used many times for uh, you know, early growth, mid growth companies, uh, tech companies. Typically, it will have an element of real estate in it. Um, right now, I'm in early stages of uh, discussions with one of the big counties here that has a huge um, uh, uh, water issue. And, you know, it's, we're trying to use foreign investment, EB-5 and direct investment as a blended approach to solve the issue there, which would affect, you know, 3 million people. Um, and, and it's a problem that's been going on for 30 years. And if it's not solved, it will create sig significant economic and uh, ecological damage. Um, so we're using EB-5 and foreign investment possibly as a blended approach to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, okay. though, that does have a real estate element to it. Um, uh, but, it but it also encompasses, you know, placing uh, manufacturing, high-tech, um, biotech uh, and uh, renewable energy. So it's a, it's a real mix. Mm -hmm. So I know we'll, we'll have time for question and answer from our attendees and, you know, from the other presenters as well, possibly later um, after everybody's had a chance to speak. But because you have a little bit more time in your slide, I'm going to ask you a question now. Um, sure. So how do uh, FDI projects in San Diego compare to other areas um, both in the U.S. and internationally? Is that something that you can, you know, give us a yeah. little idea about? I can. And that's actually a really good question. So it's very interesting. Uh, when we go back to the, 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 the report that you were looking at, Kunta, I mean, as you and I, you and I have discussed this in the past, I know mm -hmm. that, you know, depending on what report you look at, I mean, they're all roughly the same, but they, they have their little nuances. If you go to the BEA or you go to other places. Right. But they're all agreed on that, in terms of foreign direct investment, UK, Japan, Canada, pretty much trade one to three, you know, in terms of rotation. Then you've got the fast moving com uh, countries like, you know, uh, Mexico, and then you're talking about um, other countries. This is inbound US. Um, so Southern California is definitely climbing. Riverside County is really, really good at it. They get a lot of manufacturing. Um, San Diego uh, has had some EB-5 and foreign investment, typically in biotech. But I would say it's all just scratching the surface. We are about to have a boom in this. I don't think San Diego or indeed even Southern California, uh, excluding Los Angeles, has been particularly good at promoting itself um, for foreign investment. Now, there's organizations like yourself that, of course, the Global Chamber does an amazing job um, of promoting the areas that, that it's in. And we, we, um, we thank you for that. You know, the EDC has done some work, the World Trade Center. But I think what we're seeing is a real movement, uh, which is growing. Certainly, you look at places like Liverpool. I actually met the, um, from my you know, home, home country of England, I met the mayor of Liverpool this year in France for a real estate conference. And, you know, they have attracted huge amounts of foreign investment into that area because they have um, bridged the gap of the relationship. You know, I think for those that haven't, and I know the, um, my uh, co, co speakers here and yourself included can tell, you know, global, global business people, you know, we understand that in order to make that happen, you have to bridge that gap. You have to go to those countries. You have to have communication. It's not a two meeting thing. It's you've got to have 10, 15 meetings. Uh, you can't sit in your ivory tower and say, come over here, give me, you know, come and invest over here. You have to work together. It's a very collaborative effort. Um, I think San Diego, Southern California is getting better at it. Certainly, it's not in the top five by any means. You know, San Francisco, Florida, New York, they're the giants in the United States. Um, but I think we can learn a lot just to, just to sort of summarize it, I think we can learn an awful lot from some of these areas. The UK has done a great job. You, as you mentioned, some of the others that are climbing that 
that ladder. And uh, I think it's a willingness for uh, the political, civic, and public uh, private sectors to join forces to do that promotion. I think it takes a group. It isn't one, one thing. Sure. Well, thank you, Matt. Thanks. I'm sure we're going to have a lot more questions towards the end of the session, but thanks for giving us a little bit of background on San Diego. Um, I'd like to uh, turn it over now to Christine and uh, learn a little bit more about the Hong Kong uh, Trade uh, Development Council. Thank you, Katal. I appreciate it. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you to the Global Chamber for allowing me the opportunity to participate. Um, this is an, an awesome organization. We uh, connected, I believe it was about a year ago. Um, we, uh, you opened up an office here in Chicago, and then uh, we worked with another in Indianapolis. So um, we're familiar, but we're, we're trying to build uh, connections and maybe possibly work together in the future. So anyway, let me give um, a, an introduction. Um, I'm the business development manager for the Hong Kong Trade Development Council in Chicago. And so for those of you that may not be familiar with our organization, we are the official trade promotion arm of the Hong Kong government. And so our role is very similar uh, to the US Commercial Service Office in that we uh, promote trade. We promote trade using it with companies that are looking to Asia as a, a business partner but using Hong Kong as that trading platform. And so um, our services um, provide business matching opportunities, finding connections based on what type of companies people are looking to connect with. Um, we can also offer trade shows and conferences, of course, that um, put people face to face, um, networking, um, and um, build connections in that way. Um, as far as Hong Kong, many of you may do business uh, with Asia and find Hong Kong as a, a partner. For those of you that are not familiar with Hong Kong, um, we are uh, a key financial center and in, in a, a hub for logistics. So for many of the companies that are, are doing business with China or other Southeast Asian countries, they're usually in some way or, or form using Hong Kong as that, that connection. And um, our role in the past, of course, Hong Kong is a very small country. And uh, we had been known for our import-export. However, our role has changed. Our, our service sector is now becoming the forefront. And we're, we're more of a facilitator of trade. In the case of, let's say, US companies that are looking to do business in Asia, our, our Chicago office handles the Midwest. So for those companies that are looking to, um, in, in the case of a lot of your um, participants, are looking for foreign direct investment. So that's a, a key focus. How can I drive um, foreign direct investment from particularly China looking to attract them to the projects in your region. So we can help to identify um, potential investors. Um, Hong Kong is definitely a, a, a key investment route for uh, foreign direct investment from mainland China. Uh, I can give you a little bit of stats as far as, uh, let's say 2016, Hong Kong channeled 58.2% that's quite a lot of the mainland's FDI outflow. That, that equated to uh, $114.2 billion. Uh, so we're, because of our service sector, our financial sector, uh, Hong Kong is taking that, that role of the, um, the connector, but the flow of, of, the, um, of the investment is going through Hong Kong. So, um, ways that we can help with attracting foreign direct investment. We have conferences, just as you all do, that uh, have a, a key focus over the last five years. We developed two particular conferences that I think are, are right in line with, with the objective. Uh, one is called the Asian Financial Forum. 
at this particular forum, outside of, of course, hearing from very high-level speakers, you also have the opportunity to meet one-on-one -on -one project owners, meeting with investors. So you can present a, a particular project in your region. Let's say you're looking to, I don't know, uh, build some type of a uh, real estate development. And you're looking for Chinese investors that may want to um, focus on that particular region. Let's say Dallas, for instance. That's becoming a real hotbed for a lot of uh, the China investors. And so you can surely present your project, meet with a variety of investors. And, um, and as Matt said, it's, it's a matter of building relationships. You may find a match or it's that... Uh, that you know, that initial connection. If you feel that there might be some synergy, it needs to be taken to the next level. But we're giving you a, a platform for developing those relationships and building it from that point onward. So that particular event that we host, it's in January, and I, I've, we've kind of had a little bit of discussion with the Global Chamber from the management perspective about maybe doing some type of a trade mission. Your members might want to get into Asia, want to find some event or way that they can uh, reach out to, to find those, those partners. We can provide that, that opportunity. Another thing that we, Hong Kong has, has now gotten very involved in, some of you may be familiar with this concept called the Belt and Road Initiative. This is a, a massive um, plan by the, the Chinese mainland to expand what we know as the Silk Road routes, both the logistics and maritime routes. There's a lot of opportunities for U.S. companies to get involved in those projects. Of course, it's mostly China state-run enterprises that are, are putting monies into these projects, but the, the sustainability of, of this expansion that they're looking to, to, um, to grow over the next 30 years, it needs inflow from outside foreign um, investors. So if any of the participants are, are looking for investment opportunities in Asia, uh, this Belt and Road projects can be something to consider. Also, companies that are in the service sector, maybe their, their expertise is in engineering, business management, finance, um, risk mitigation. Those type of companies could partner with some Hong Kong companies that are already in, immersed within these projects and, and develop a key role. But once again, it's a matter of going to the region meeting people, developing a relationship, and then from that, uh, there will be uh, potential opportunities uh, to get involved in the projects. Um, what else can I tell you about our organization? We've been around for over 50 years. We've got offices worldwide. So I'm in Chicago, but we have offices in, in London, um, in India, uh, Miramar, um, we're, we're in all the major business centers globally. So if people are looking to, to find a connection, we're, we're actually probably in the country already that, that you're, um, you know, you're established in. So we can try to help you in building connections through our, our global offices. So, Christine, actually, you know, and we do want to keep this moving, but just very quickly, um, what are the best ways to find investors that, that you find, you know, especially, I know Belt and Road Initiative is, is probably geared towards that, yes. but, um, you know, uh, are there uh, also technology options that can utilize AI, for instance, um, to predict who the best investors will be, you know, mm -hmm. so what, what, what do you all find from your end, because Belt and Road is a, a fairly large initiative, 
It is. And, um, you know, it's, it's well known and uh, Hong Kong is a major hub of investment activity to begin with. So, so give us some insight. Give us your little secret sauce. <laughs> yeah, so we, as the, from the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, we understand that this is a, a very difficult thing to try to find those connections. Mm -hmm. And so we actually created a portal which I, I've, I've done a lot of research to try to find something similar to it. And this is the only one that I've come across of which we actually list projects based on country, amount of investment, um, the sector. Uh, so let's say you're looking to do investment in technology, um, you know, AI, like you mentioned. We can, we can filter those projects based on your interest and level of investment and you have the opportunity then to directly contact the person in charge of those projects and, and try to set up some initial conversation. And then if, you know, as, as emails go back and forth, you know how things go into spam and so forth, and if people have difficulty in making that first connection, our offices globally can, can facilitate that, that uh, connection. We can ask our Hong Kong office to make some um, formal introductions, you know, and so forth. But, but we do, I do feel that this portal that we have, I, I, I can share the information with you all, not just because it's our organization's piece that we put together, but it is, I find, the most useful resource in identifying the key projects in the regions and those that would, an investor would be interested in in um, getting involved in. Well, thank you very much for giving us a little bit of a look into what's happening in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. I think we definitely would like to know a little bit more about Belt and Road and specific sectors and, yes. and you know, industries and kind of the, the latest activity. But I think what we'll do is we'll come back to that sure. during Q&A. And, and there are a couple of questions that are sort of open for everybody to answer, but but we'll get to that towards the end. Um, nice. But thank you very much. And uh, moving on, we will uh, talk to now Jagat Shah, who is in uh, Gujarat, in Ahmedabad, Gujarat. And uh, if you can tell us a little bit about what's happening in India uh, through the Vibrant Summits, uh, as well as just generally in your dealings with you know the government of India as well. Thank you, Kuntal, and uh, thanks and congrats to Global Chamber, Doug, Cesar, Kuntal, you know, to a <clears throat> wonderful organization. I met Doug last year when I went on a mentor on road tour in the uh, U.S. So <clears throat> what I do is the last 22 years I run an organization called Global Network in uh, India. And uh, we, uh, I represent, for the last nine years I was working with the government of Manitoba. Uh, the state in Canada as the Trade and Investment Commissioner for India. And uh, I had the freedom to do my own uh, individual consulting also. So we have worked in almost about 40 countries and we do a lot of trade and investment delegations. We have led about 166 delegations. And uh, the focus of our work has always been <clears throat> trade, facilitating trade, foreign direct investment, technology transfer, joint ventures. We have facilitated in last 16 years about 110 joint ventures, um, about 80 of them in India and 30 abroad uh, between Indian and foreign companies. We do a lot of international business trainings and B2B meetings. Uh, what's happening in India, I will tell you is, uh, and then I'll come to the uh, vibrant Gujarat model, is uh, amongst the large economies, India is now the fastest growing economy in the world. And uh, it is reflected in the fact that it has become a third largest uh, country by purchase power. Uh, 425 million broadband subscribers, uh, which is driving the digital movement in the country. 500 million is the urban population, 300 million middle class population. And we are going to add 150 million uh, to that population by 2025. So that will be 450 million middle class and 175 gigawatt of renewable energy being added by 2022. 100 smart cities under construction, 1,000 smart villages. Uh, as we speak, 80 new ports are being built. 100 million homes are being built. 
last year we produced 26 million automobiles in the country so <clears throat> when you look at all this and the the fact that we are the youngest nation in the world about 65 percent of india's population is below 35 years of age and 50 percent of india's population is below 25 years of age that is driving the indian economy average age of india is today 29 years so the youth and sectors like infrastructure education healthcare pharmaceuticals automobiles startups is becoming big uh, last year we became the second largest startup nation in the world after us so so how uh, india is attracting uh, foreign direct investment is like last year we attracted about 82 billion dollar uh, there is a program which is called vibrant gujarat which uh, the current prime minister mr modi when he was the chief minister of gujarat he initiated in 2003 and he just wanted to have a knowledge platform where uh, people from around the world are invited to share that how they in their countries uh, handle uh, you know investment like we are doing in this webinar and uh, it was a very small event about 200 uh, people attended from uh, six seven countries and from india but it kept growing so for example last year when it was held about 12,000 companies attended from 130 countries including about 16 prime ministers and so that that has become the engine of growth and uh, <clears throat> this now it is going to be the ninth version which will happen from 18th to 20th of january 2019 and prime minister modi will inaugurate it uh, we have been part of that in terms of doing their international road shows and then uh, we uh, started doing uh, smaller versions of vibrant gujarat like vibrant kutch which is a, a province in gujarat a smaller uh, district in gujarat and then vibrant saurashtra and vibrant ceramics and just last week we completed in the southern state vibrant tamil nadu the focus of these uh, are, are interesting so what has happened in india and i believe around the world is that the large companies if you look at the fortune 500 companies uh, they they have their uh, resources they have their highly paid people they have all information access they have market intelligence uh, it is actually the small medium enterprises which uh, which is uh, the target for uh, india for investment and uh, if you look at the us for example us to india data about 2000 american companies have invested in india in manufacturing and services so and out of these 2000 uh, in terms of numbers 92 percent are small medium enterprises so we under vibrant gujarat and vibrant tamil nadu we target small medium enterprises Enterprises. but first we look at trade uh, this is a bit of different approach than I have seen in many places like when I go to select USA every year in select USA Washington DC we take a delegation from India and we find that investment is the front stage what we have been doing is we are focusing on trade first because we have experienced that the moment uh, companies from abroad start doing trade with Indian companies over next two three years the natural next step is going to be investment because the moment they start seeing the trade is happening and they are now comfortable because it is very difficult to do business in india at the same time you know we in ease of doing business we rank at 100 out of 189 which has improved in last three years because just three years back it used to be 142 so so it's still difficult to do business so it takes about two to three years for these companies to really understand what is the scope of uh, business in India which is huge and that is the time when they uh, start you know looking at investment and uh, maybe manufacturing in India and then buying back there are many such examples so this is the approach we take and one very interesting uh, innovation we uh, added and it has become a huge success is we connect academia to industry so in all of our vibrant series we uh, what we do is we identify students who are studying mba and we attach one student to each foreign investor uh, morning to evening so they, they we call them buddies so the moment these people they land in the airport they are received with a welcome rose and then they brought to the hotel and then to the venue and then to the discussions they are there any translation challenges lunch area sightseeing shopping whatever so the three days conference three days they are with them so they become their buddies that that becomes a huge thing because the cultural gap gets you know uh, addressed 
these buddies they explain them about the culture of india and uh, they are there to help them so that has been a huge huge uh, innovation and huge uh, success for us so this is uh, primarily uh, you know what i wanted to share and you you asked one uh, question about artificial artificial intelligence being used as a technology tool we have developed a mobile app <clears throat> which is called abli free and right now that uh, app is uh, targeting only trade but it is an amazing, it, is, it is a combination of facebook linkedin instagram twitter everything together so what happens is that anybody who is on abli free uh, would be able to uh, see each other in a radius of uh, about 15 till uh, 15 miles and uh, understand each other's businesses and even make a phone call or or an email so so that is something which has uh, which we are working on for last one year and we hope to now move to the investment uh, side of it because our trade part has become extremely successful so kuntal that's it what i wanted to share on india Hello. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. We, we do have one quick question for you before we move on to James. Um, Doug is actually congratulating you, and we all, I think we all do, on your historic trade missions. Um, what do you find are the key factors for progress with FDI, particularly in India? You see, <clears throat> the key factor is the comfort level which uh, any foreign investor would get in terms of government uh, you know approvals because since the ease of doing business in India is low, which means that it takes a, a lot of government government role to get many approvals. So the moment we are able to justify that, and that is why vibrant Gujarat has become successful because it's the it used to be the chief minister of the state who would be present at the event morning to evening. He used to sleep there. He used to have a room where he would he would sleep there and you know so meet meet people every time so that that confidence and now as a prime minister uh, that is what he does when three day event takes place he is there in vibrant gujarat for three days so the the confidence that government is with you is, is a big uh, big game changer for any investor and uh, of course the bureaucracy is also there and all questions are answered and timelines are given and nowadays in most of the government offices in india there is a timeline chart mentioned for any application and very interesting models are being practiced. For example, you you make an application for any kind of uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, approval which you need, and in 21 days, uh, if you do not get the approval, it is assumed to have been granted. Right. So 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 that becomes a big uh, the, your application mm -hmm. itself is your approval. Right. Even though even if any ministry or government raises any queries, that's okay. They can be answered in next one year. That, that is not an issue. But so that's an application. So yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but, but that's a huge shift, I think, as we yes. all know, you know, Absolutely. particularly in India. So a huge part of this is the bureaucracy, right? And, and right. I think it's almost a cliche at this point, but, you know, being able to really smoothen the process um, and, and getting rid of whatever excessive red tape there might be. And in some countries that's more applicable than in others, but I think that's essentially what you're saying. Right, right. Yeah. So, and Doug was asking a question here about when can the uh, AI be used? I believe free. It is, it is open now. You can use, but right now it is for trade. So exports, imports. But we are uh, by by December this year. Move. We are moving into investment into that ability free uh, application. Okay. Thank you so much. I, I, I know we have a number of questions. We'll get to those uh, at the end, but I want to move on to James. And, and I think, you know, particularly in San Diego, um, we have uh, done a lot with, um, you know, sort of keeping track of, of the UK post Brexit. And uh, I think this will be very interesting to hear from you what, what London and Partners is doing, particularly for London. Well, thank you so much, and thanks to the Global Chamber, uh, the amazing the work that you do across, wow, 525 metro areas, including London, which is great, and thanks to you, Kuntal, for the invite to join today. 
I'm with London and Partners, which is the Mayor of London's international promotional agency. And I want to uh, briefly touch on London and Partners, but then talk about very briefly about three topics or issues that we're discussing in this Brexit world, really, to continue to promote London to global audiences. So London and Partners, uh, I'm based in LA, working out of one of our 13 global offices at London and Partners. Uh, we're the Mayor of London's international promotional agency. And, you know, I don't want to talk too much about, what, uh, about us as an organization, except to say that we are a public-private partnership, and we work uh, to attract, uh, to promote London to all kinds of international audiences. So we attract tourists to London, we attract students to London, we attract major events, exhibitions and conferences to London. Uh, but I'm focused on the trade and inward investment side, so attracting US businesses who are looking to set up, expand and grow in London, and also to support London-based scale-ups, exploring opportunities in North America. And I, you know, I think this joined up approach, so promoting London to all kinds of different audiences, works really well because it allows us to strategically attract all kinds of investment and people into London using consistent messages across all kinds of different audiences. Now, about our messaging, especially uh, in this new world, uh, post the Brexit referendum. Uh, now, now, I expect all the panelists today, as, as we've heard, to be slightly biased about their regions. You know, I know I certainly am. And one of the things I really love about London is the fact that you really do have everything to grow a business within, you know, a short tube ride or bus ride or taxi ride from, uh, from everyone at, everywhere else. So London is a financial services hub. It's the center of government. It has four of the world's top 50 universities, and that's not including Cambridge and Oxford, just down the road. Uh, it has strengths in creative industries, life sciences, tech, smart city and urban infrastructure and so much more. But, but we recognize that London is strong because we collaborate. And, I, and we think this will be increasingly important in this post-Brexit world. And that's one of the three things that we want to talk about really briefly. So how, we see, how we're gonna talk about the future of London, talking about collaboration, and talking about how London is open. So future of London, I mean, we see London as a melting pot of people from around the world who are constantly reinventing and rebuilding and adapting to take advantage of, of new waves of change, really. And, you know, it's where for 2,000 years, Londoners have, have set standards. We've shaped new industries. We've built new institutions, but only to rebel against them or, or that and, and drive new cycles of innovation. So being at the heart of where business, creativity, tech, finance, and science all converge, you know, our city, London, provides a home for Londoners, old and new, to grow and benefit from its success. So, so our vision uh, of London in this Brexit world is that we see London's future as a city where new ideas continue to mix, clash, and merge. And Londoners, and that includes everyone who comes to London, everyone who visits London, I think, you know, like we've done in the past, we'll, we'll continue to adapt to new realities, to navigate technological change, to come together to tackle global issues that impact us all, and to really harness innovation as a force for good. So I hope that begins to show why London will continue to be an important investment hub after Brexit, and how we're showcasing not only London's history, but the future of London and our key messaging. So, so that's about the future of London, number one. Number two, just to talk about collaboration, uh, you know, it's just as important talking about the future of London as talking about how we collaborate, especially with other cities, I think, as it is cities that are continuing to drive new ideas, new policies, and growth. So let, let me give you some examples from across the world, really. Uh, here in Europe, we're opening new uh, offices in Paris and Berlin and, and really working with those cities to attract investment from uh, North America and around the world into Europe, working together with those other centers across Europe. Uh, we're talking about the Belt and Road. We're positioning London as the Western hub uh, for the Belt and Road Initiative. And we believe that that will add uh, you know, around $2.4 billion annually to UK GDP. 
Uh, and you know, we're all already seeing London-based professional financial services companies central to the success of that. So companies like Standard Chartered, HSBC, Clifford Chance, all central to, to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and we have the soft infrastructure as well required to enable Belt and Road success and, and, and collaboration with other organizations that allows this. And here in the US, so I've talked about Europe and, and with the Belt and Road, and here in the US, we're working very closely with other cities, uh, especially to drive opportunities for London and UK based companies uh, coming to North America and, and with other global markets, uh, often led by the mayor of London or, or our deputy mayor, who's our chairman and a fintech entrepreneur. We're bringing delegations out around the world, so you know, utilizing that FBI expertise, but also that uh, that that trade, i.e., London companies coming out as well, especially in North America, but also around the world. And speaking of the mayor, and onto the third point, so that future of London and collaboration, and just talk about uh, London is open, London remains open in, in this Brexit world. So speaking of the mayor, immediately after the Brexit referendum. Uh, he led the London is Open campaign, uh, which really show, is, is aimed to show that London is united and open for business. And again, it's all about London's future. So the London is Open campaign emphasizes that really London is open to everyone and that we will continue to welcome the flow of brilliant ideas and talent from really around the world and also celebrate the diversity that the one million foreign nationals living in London bring to the city. So, you know, we are clearly in a, in a period of change and some uncertainty. But, you know, global companies continue to view London and the future of London with excitement. And, for example, here from California, we've seen Apple, and since the referendum vote, we've seen Apple announce a new London headquarters. We've seen Google making, uh, investing in a new UK headquarters with 3,000 jobs. Snapchat have made London their international hub. They're headquartered here in LA, of course. Amazon are doubling the capacity of their London office and Facebook are making London their biggest development center outside of Silicon Valley. So of course there are challenges, but as we look to the future of London, the fact that London is open and how we can collaborate with cities globally to drive uh, global growth that's how we're really viewing uh, the future of London and, and how London and partners can continue to attract investment, tourists, people to London and support London companies to be successful globally. Thank you, James, for that picture. But uh, I think what I would also ask you is, are there specific industries that you can point to? I mean, I think we, we you know, generally those in uh, international trade and development will know, um, you know, London very well, but are there particular industries post-Brexit that are emerging um, that may be slightly different, you know, uh, from, from prior to the vote? Um, are there industries that are, are looking to grow further um, that are being prioritized? And so would love to hear, you know, sort of how the landscape is changing, if at all, in London and across the UK. Yeah, it's a good question. I think uh, the great thing about London, as I mentioned, is that it is a place that it is a, it, it's not just focused on one industry. You know, perhaps here in the US, to really engage with government, you have to go to DC. The energy sector is highly focused in, in Houston and Texas and maybe LA and New York for the creative industries, whereas London has all of that. But I think what London also has is the ability to, to drive new industry. So, and the fact that there are more developers in London than any other uh, global city outside of San Francisco and the Bay Area, you know, really enables that convergence. So what we're seeing continuing to emerge post-Brexit, but I think it was happening even before that, uh, are, are where financial services are converging with tech to create a, you know, the world's leading fintech hub, where uh, digital health is really emerging because of the access you have to data through the NHS and the tech uh, expertise in London. You're seeing a fantastic digital health uh, focus arise, especially in that golden triangle of, of London, Cambridge, and Oxford. Uh, it's, um, and also, you know, ad tech, because we've always had a very strong advertising industry. And so that convergence with the tech industry. So I think we're seeing that 
real convergence. And I think that's where London will continue to have strength. It's that ability to work across multiple industries combined with that, uh, you know, that desire to innovate that London has and the diversity that London has, you know, 230 languages spoken means that new ideas are constantly emerging in London. And, and London has the, I think, the talent and now the kind of entrepreneurial spirit to enable those new industries to, to grow. Um, is there one particular industry, and I, I would sort of, you know, ask this across the board, and, and uh, we can certainly get to the rest of the panel uh, later, but um, is there one particular industry that you really point to, you know, when you, when you sit down and talk with somebody and say, you know, think, think London, um, is there one particular industry that you point to and say, here's the leader? I, I mean, I, I, I think especially fintech. You know, we've seen some fantastic uh, homegrown companies. You, you know, we've right. seen unicorns emerge in London like TransferWise and, and Revolut. And the fact is that London, alongside New York, remains, and we would argue, the leading global financial services center. So you do have that, that, that market there. Uh, as I said, more developers than any other uh, you, you know, city in Europe, certainly. So, you know, when you have that, uh, you know, the world's leading global financial services center, alongside a, a, a tech talent, I think that's, that's created some really amazing things. So that's something we, we love to shout about. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we'll learn a little bit more uh, lit, later in the session, but I'd like to uh, move on to Mr. Cesar Peñaranda from Pro Inversion Peru. And uh, please tell us what's happening from Lima and tell us a little bit about your organization. Cesar, I think what they, they, there may be some technical issues here, but uh, uh, let's give it a minute. Okay, well, while they're, while they are still, um, I think, uh, perhaps trying to get connected, uh, why don't we go ahead and um, at least have a little bit of conversation and discussion here amongst ourselves, and, and when, when they're ready, they can jump in. Um, so, it, we have a question here. Uh, as each of you look to other regions of the world, um, other than your own, who do you think is best at uh, attracting um, FDI? Who do you admire and look up to or say, you know what, they're doing a really good job? And obviously, of course, the economic landscapes are so different from region to region. Um, Okay, well, well, we'll get to that. We'll get to that question in a minute. It seems like uh, Cesar is with us. Cesar, yeah. hello. How are you? I'm, I'm very sorry. Good, good, good. I'm very sorry. We're having some technical issues here. I don't know why. No problem. It's very. <laughs> not a, the, the timing is not very good to, to have these issues. But uh, anyway, uh, it's don't a privilege worry. to be here again. In, in, in this platform. Um, thanks again for the for the Global Chamber for the invitation. Um, just tell you a little bit about ProInversion. Um, we are the private investment promotion agency, so we are in charge basically of, of promoting uh, private investment in general in Peru. But we're basically now focused on P3s, on public par uh, private partnerships. Uh, that's how we know our core, our goal over the last, uh, probably the last couple of years, the last two years. Um, you still hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, we can, we can hear you Sorry. and we can see you. It's perfect okay. on our end, so it, no worries. It, it, so yeah, it's, it, it's basically P3s. We're focusing P3s, and we have a very ambitious and very diversified platform for the two and a half, next two years, basically. We have a, a pipeline of uh, more than $11 million um, for basically the rest of this year, 2019 and 2020. Uh, what we're doing a little bit of 2020 actually and this 
pipeline could easily go to more than 20 billion uh, because we're probably going to receive a mandate of a, a package of transport projects um, in a few months. So we're talking about 20 billion until 2019, 2020, uh, maybe more uh, in P3 projects. And, and I highlight, uh, the, well, this, we're talking basically about FDI, right? And as you know, uh, why the importance of pro-inversion? Because P3 projects in, in countries like ours are the ones that move the needle, right? They are the ones that really close the gap. We have a, um, an infrastructure gap of $160 billion in Peru. If you remember that Peru has a GDP of 200 billion, we're talking about 80% of GDP in, in infrastructure. And I think that's kind of a, a, a general problem in, in the whole Latin America, right? A, a gap of infrastructure. So Proinversion has a huge role, a core role in really solving this issue. We're doing it with a very aggressive and now strategy of going to the main markets. Now, if we have a, we have to start uh, projects in basically every sector, we're talking about transport, water and sanitation, wastewater treatment plants, portable water plants, a health sector, energy, like uh, the use of natural gas, distribution, midstream, downstream projects, um, energy transmission, uh, education. So we're talking about the whole package, different sectors are really promoting in, in different regions of our country also. And, and basically what we're doing now, if we have focused our strategy in fillers. Uh, the first one is um, making Proinversion a center of excellence. We're, we're really like the investment bank of the state. Uh, we see the mandates from the, the ministries and we structure the mandates to take them to market. Uh, so we really, when I mention center of excellence, we really want to work with the top advisors. What we're, we're trying to do is bring the top advisors, I'm talking about financial, technical, legal advisors. Actually, in Amanda, we're having a, a, an event uh, with top advisors. Uh, we have been working with the Mud McDonald's of the world, the Goldman Sachs. Um, um, IFC, the World Bank, we want to keep really working with these top advisors in the structuring phase, which is ours formally, and also in the formulation phase, which is not ours formally, it's in the ministry's hand, but we can serve as advisors. So first, again, is the center of, of, of excellence. Second is the socialization. We're really socializing most of our projects um, so that the communities really can uh, feel the benefits of the project for themselves. For example, if there's a, a, a particular project in, in water and sanitation, really socializing with the community the importance, the benefits this project will bring to them. This is key because, of course, um, if, if the population is, is on board with the project, it makes, it, makes it makes us really, or, or facilitates the process for us, right? The third uh, pillar is the commercial strategy. That, that's kind of in my in my shoulders. I'm the head of investor services in in at Inversion. Uh, we have been applying a very uh, an investment bank strategy here, uh, kind of doing a lot of targeting. If we have a particular project in water and sanitation, for example, okay, let's say water and sanitation. We, we have a wastewater treatment plant right now in 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 our pipeline. This is a huge, very emblematic project that recently won. Um, an award for the best sustainability green infrastructure project. Um, we received the prize in the CGLA infrastructure forum in Miami three weeks ago. Uh, so if once we uh, identify the project, we see, let's see in which target markets we go to, right? Which are the, the, the markets or the countries that really have the potential to know how to develop projects like this, Titicaca wastewater treatment plants. When we have heard these markets, we then do a hunting. We do, okay, th these are the markets. Let's now really identify which companies are the ones that are going to potentially bid for this project. For example, the Kaka Wastewater Treatment Plant, right now we have three of the 10 best companies in the world. Uh, we have FCC, we have Veolia, and the proponent, because it was an unsolicited proposal, is a Spanish consortium formed uh, by uh, Acciona and Tedawa, Spanish companies. So we're really doing a very active strategy of promoting going to main markets and really trying to bring the best uh, 
potential bidders to our processes and also advisors. Again, we're also, I want to really highlight that. We want to work with the, with the best advisors. And the fourth pillar, more organizational. Um, we're part of the, of the state, but a more technical agency. A lot of, of, of the guys here come from investment banking. We're trying to really bring a lot of talent to, to the agency. Uh, and, and also one of the things we're doing as we, as any private company does, working with KPIs. For example, if I have the, the, the commercial strategy in, in, in my shoulders, uh, I need to make, a sh make sure that I can bring certain amount of investors to each process, right? That's kind of my goal with my boss, which is the executive director. Um, so that those are kind of the four uh, pillars, all looking for a, for a goal which again bridging this huge infrastructure that we have of 160 billion again until 2025. This is a, a, an approximation, and of course, us having this mandate of of, of the P3 projects, which are the ones that really move the needle. We have a lot of in our shoulders. Uh, we really need, need to be active. We have been receiving a lot of support from our, let's say our dad in the state, which is the Ministry of Finance. Um, we're kind of a, a, a member of, 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 of the chain in the Ministry of Finance. So we're doing a lot of, uh, of, of active promotion. We have very a very diversified platform, again, probably more than 20 billion until 2020, and in many sectors. Um, I don't know, and, and, well, of course, uh, here it says that I should also talk about some of the markets. Um, we have been going to, to, to a lot of markets, a lot of road shows. We've been recently in Europe, um, in, in the UK, basically for, to, to, to gather some of the top advisors. We were in, in Switzerland in, and in France, and we were in Asia also. Asia is a top, um, um, uh, let's say, targeted market for us. We were in China, Japan, and, and Korea, and they really have a lot of interest in our transport project, water and sanitation, hospitals. Uh, so again, uh, we have been really opening kind of the, the, the potential leaders that we want in our processes. We want as, as much competition as we can is, is best for us. So that's kind of the strategy that we have been applying. Uh, and more than happy to receive any questions that, that you may have. Uh, let me unmute myself. Thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, I think we can open up the conversation. I, I, it's so good to have you here, Cesar, just to, you know, Thanks give us again. a picture of, of what's happening in Latin America as well, because I think, uh, or a section of Latin America and, and South America, because I think what's happening in that region is really sort of under the radar in, in a way, you know, and, it, and it's nice to kind of um, uh, put it uh, in, in plain light. And so with that, let's, um, let's go to some questions here. So I think I started out asking each of you, um, and, and, you know, one of you can answer. We, we've got about a half an hour. We can go a little bit over, but, um, you know, uh, you know, we don't have to go through the whole panel, but whoever would like to answer, please jump in. Um, so as each of you look to regions of the world, um, which areas do you admire in terms of, you know, who's really doing FDI well and, and um, which regions are, are really doing a good job of attracting uh, foreign investment and, and what you think they're doing well. So please, uh, anyone jump in. Um, I, I could jump in. Um, yeah. Um, uh, we have been trying to use some benchmarks also in, in, in at Preinversion. Uh, we have been talking a lot with the top um, PPP agencies, for example, uh, Ontario, Infrastructure Ontario, uh, the UK. Um, I think what they have, and I really think this is what we need as, as emerging markets, um, and we really have to, to apply this, is uh, really have a plan, a long-term plan, right? Some of the things that we really lack right now in Peru is a, is a national infrastructure plan. And when we go to, to certain markets, for example, to Asia, and we present the pipeline for the next two years, as I mentioned, uh, probably 11 billion, but probably more than 20, they tell, they tell us, okay, this is nice, but can we, you show us the plan for the next 10 years? Um, so this is something that we really kind of have to... Um, 
to assimilate um, and, and really have to push. This is something that uh, uh, hopefully in Peru we're going to develop very soon, having a long-term plan. I think the countries that that uh, attract foreign investments are the ones that really have this long-term plan that really can answer expectations. Uh, in the end, we're talking about institutions, right? A country that really can guarantee institutionally uh, what you're going to have in, in the next in the next few years. So we really can have uh, 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 an infrastructure plan. Uh, I think that will be key. And I think the top agencies and the countries that are, have been really successful in this are the ones that have really uh, focused on having a plan. And I also would add having a, a very smooth uh, procurement process. Uh, when we talk about, uh, I'm obviously talking about P3s, which is a little bit more sophisticated. You go from the planning, programming, formulation, structuring, and the transaction phase. Uh, the agencies that really also have every step very smoothly uh, defined are the ones that really are going to have the success. Uh, at Preinversion, for example, we're char in charge of the structuring. We receive the mandates from the ministries. We're also now trying to advise the ministry in the formulation, because of course, if you don't um, feed your child very good in the early years, it's impossible to, to take him to Harvard when he's 20 years old, right? And so really have to um, good, do a good formulation to, to have a good structuring. So we're really trying to also advise the, the ministries in, 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 this, in this phase. So again, I would say long-term planning and having uh, the, all the chain, the procurement process really smoothly and really defined so that you can really answer expectation of the private sectors. In the end, we're talking about institutions, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thanks. And uh, you know, feel free anyone else to jump in. Otherwise, I'll go on to the next question. I, I just wanted to perhaps um, uh, solidify and just back up what Cesar was saying because um, I, I feel like that's very important, especially when he's talking about institutional money or fund money. Um, you know, there's a lot of that segment which would be, you know, we see we see a lot we see a lot of real estate transactions here and uh, company mergers and acquisitions, where it might be a um, insurance fund, for an example, that's coming out of Asia and they're looking to diversify their portfolio into the United States. You know, I'm, I'm on the West Coast, so I'm specifically talking about West Coast US. Um, and that's a great model for them. But when you're talking larger funds and institutions for like those P3 projects that he's talking about, uh, I totally agree. It has to be, again, it goes back to to you know a team and it takes a plan and it's a structured process these are not one and done deals these are not uh meet in a hotel a couple of times shake hands and get it done you know th this is something that requires a lot of people uh and um uh, a lot of planning but when it's right it works beautifully um you know there there are some examples around the world where that's worked really really well so um, yeah, I just want to say I totally agree with that. Uh, much like what, what James does at London Partners, you know, that, that's a really, for me, that's a really interesting institution because, you know, specifically for London, obviously I have a lot of, uh, my heart is in London, I used to live there. Um, but it's interesting that they're purely focused on the area so they can really zero in on, um, you know, London specifically. I think Select USA and do a great job in the United States, but their reach is so broad. Um, they have a tough job, whereas someone like James, I'm not saying your, your job isn't tough, James, but uh, you know, it's great that you're able to zero in on an area. And I feel like that's a really interesting model for any other organization. And the same with Christine, where they can really say, look, we're for, our focus is here and that's what we're really expert in. Otherwise, this thing just becomes a, you know, it's a, it's a monster <laughs> to have to deal with. So um, I do have a question that's uh, pertaining to Asia. So I think, Christine, maybe you can help answer this. Um, uh, William is asking for the Asia region. I believe China, Japan, and Singapore are leading at the top of FDI mm -hmm. uh, into Asian emerging markets uh, region and countries. 
However, I also notice that there has been a decline of U.S. and Europe investment into Asia. Um, how can we encourage the U.S. and European investors uh, to invest back in, especially into emerging markets, markets in Southeast Asia, and, or what can Asian countries uh, do to invite these investors? Now, I know Hong Kong is very different. Um, you know, it's positioned very differently. The history is very different, um, and the economy is very different, but perhaps you might have a little bit of insight. Mm -hmm. Well, I actually was, um, I had listened to a, a webinar uh, that was put together by Select USA, and they had some of the representatives from the U.S. government talk about the U.S.'s kind of denial about the Belt and Road for quite a long time. <laughs> and now in the recent months, it's started to uh, come to the forefront. They're seeing that there is a lot of activity by uh, companies um, outside of the U.S. that are looking at it as, uh, since our the TPP is, we've, we've um, disassociated ourselves with it, there is this growing emergence in the um, in Europe, Asia, and uh, even in Africa. I have one company from Kentucky, of all places, who is very interested in setting up U.S. auto manufacturing in Africa, and he is looking for investors. And so what he did was um, he, he went to, I mentioned our, our Asian Financial Forum, and he presented a project there. He met with investors, but in that process, he met other people. And one, uh, a company from Russia is very interested in, um, in investing in this auto manufacturing. It's also an education facility. It's a way of helping economies that that need to grow, need help, need help with their, 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 their people to, to uh, be educated, make money, and sustain a living. And so that's, that was his vision. And he, he found uh, an investor that, that wanted to, to help to get that vision to um, flourishing. Um, ways that we can, um, I, I, I just feel that even though the U.S. government may have been slow to recognize the Belt and Road, companies um, are, are acting as pioneers. They're, they're reaching out on their own. I can tell you another instance. We had a group from Dallas, uh, as well as from Chicago, go to Hong Kong in June. We had a, a, a Belt and Road Summit. The summit was basically a way to to get firsthand information about what's going on, meet with some of the project owners. These two groups, they are very diverse. One of, I mean, some of the um, participants, they, they deal, they were looking for foreign direct investment. They're in real estate projects in Dallas. Another is an architectural firm. Um, another is uh, in renewable energy. You know, their, their, their sectors, have relevance in these um, Belt and Road uh, countries, and so they're looking. How do I, how do I, gather information? It's a research process. It takes time to figure out how do I fit in as a small and medium-sized company. The big players, the Fortune 500s, they're already there. They're already part of it. But a lot of the um, you know, the, the China government now with these trade policies that have been in place, there is some stifling from what I, I got feedback from that, that webinar that I, I listened to. There is some stifling of U.S. company participation in some of the projects based on this friction of the trade policy. So it's, it's a very um, perplexing political dynamics that's going on right now. And I, I think it's a, 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 an observance of what's going on today versus a month from now. It may shift very quickly. But companies want to, want to do business internationally. They see the opportunities, and that's never going to go away. The, the, those emerging markets are, are a hotbed for growth and market strategy, and it, but it's, 
going to be a maybe a, a five year plan, a ten year plan to see those uh, those strategies come to um, come into play. Does that help to answer your question? I think that gives us a little bit of an insight for sure. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because um, you mentioned, uh, you know, the Fortune 500s. Jagat also mentioned Fortune 500s. Mm -hmm. So it, this brings up a really interesting point because then uh, a question I have is, how do the Fortune 500s know? <laughs> what information do they have? that, um, you know, uh, governments either are, are providing to um, other smaller businesses, for instance, uh, and, you know, is the information different? And, you know, where is their overlap? And, and uh, so, yeah, how, how, how do the Fortune 500s know? Is it their own forecasting? Are they also depending on um, government information, on the World Bank, on the IMF, mm -hmm. um, you know, on the... Uh, uh, on the international banks or, um, you know, how are they gathering that information and figuring out this is where we need to be? And then how are organizations like yours, um, you know, providing information as well? So I think that's a really, really key factor in all of this. Mm -hmm. Well, many of the Fortune 500 companies, of course, they have boots on the ground. They right. have, they have inroads already in a lot of the countries that these developments are going on. And they, they see the vision, they see, let, let's say, for instance, Caterpillar. They've been in China for years, right? But they, have, uh, they see the progress that is going on with these development of, of new logistic routes throughout Europe and Asia, and, uh, and they see the opportunities. They're, they're connecting with the governments in the um, countries that these expansions are going on. And they're making those those connections early on, uh, so that when the the, um, the the procurement is is in place, they're looking for um, securing contracts. They've already developed those relationships with the governments within those developing regions, and I think that's key too. And for us, our organization, we have connections within those regions, so we can surely provide some market intelligence and research to companies that, that say, let's say Miramar, that's a market that we're looking at. Can you give me some data on this? And we do have data on it. Can we connect me to the governments within those regions? And we can do that as well. And just like when, within India, there's so much growth. I think, uh, and even in, uh, let's see, um, is it Pakistan? Wind, wind and solar energy is becoming a real hotbed for development. Also, I believe in India, there is a rail uh, that is is um, um, in in and uh, expansion of ports. Let's say in Poland. So I think it's a, it's about I following uh, uh, the data that is maybe provided by the um, the World Bank. Um, um, through our organization and others and just tracking where the progress is taking place, but getting in and meeting the key government players within those regions and get a relationship started. Uh, good point. And I think maybe this is more of a rhetorical question, but something to think about. You know, I think my question was more to the point of, is there data and information that the Fortune 500s have mm -hmm. that perhaps um, is separate from what maybe other companies, smaller companies and investors might, may, not investors, but smaller companies might be getting just through other sources. So it's something... Yeah something to consider and um but but building on yes i think i was going to say Kanta, i think that i think that is a really big point uh you know i deal on both ends of the spectrum uh you know from the ev5 side I mean, it's individuals just purely doing an investment or an e2 investment i mean it's kind of the smallest end of the scale right i mean an e2 in visa could be 100 150 thousand dollars um and then all the way up to a, a merger or uh, an expanding business, you know, which would be what I would call a small to medium sized enterprise to some of the giant companies. And I think Christine hit, hit the nail on the head, you know, they've got boots on the ground, they have analysts, 
they're working with, and they have access, they have deep pockets. So they're working, you know, they have all the Dun & Bradstreet data. They have, the list goes on and on. And they have connections. So they're probably talking to um, those in the know. And, um, you know, they understand what's coming down the pipe and they have the ability to digest that information. So, you know, I think it's, um, you, do, you do have this end of the scale and this end. And I think here, you know, the small end, it's that entrepreneurial uh, challenge that any entrepreneur has, you know, of figuring out where and how and why and when. Um, and then you, you, as you scale up, you know, you have the, the banks. You also have, they also have investment banks that will work for them. Like, mm -hmm. you know, Christine mentioned mm -hmm. Caterpillar. I mean, they'll have, I don't know who they use, but they'll have a huge investment bank that's probably working on their behalf to decide, yeah, you guys should uh, invest the next 300 million here. Um, so, you know, people like myself, we're trying to tap into that yeah, <laughs> and learn from it. Absolutely. Well, um, it, it, another broad question and, and maybe, uh, you know, Cesar from uh, Lima and Jagat in India can also um, chime in on this. But uh, how do you keep up with tech trends? You know, how does that impact um, how you prioritize your efforts and the markets uh, and market your region? And uh, like, for instance, fintech, blockchain, um, Internet of Things, autonomous vehicles. You know, how, how do you, from an investment perspective, keep up with those uh, technical, technological changes? So Cesar, maybe you'd like to answer that question. Um, yes, uh, of course. Can you hear me well? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, because I, yes. I can I can see you. I see you like like uh, statues. I don't know what okay. happened to you with the images. <laughs> All right. You're um, moving. <laughs> <laughs> we see you clearly. Yeah, so. that's good. That's good. That's that's good. Uh, so in in terms of P3s, probably the, 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 the things you mentioned, um, uh, yeah, are things that we have to consider. But um, probably in the phase that we are, we're still developing a lot of, there's a lot of infrastructure to develop. What we are, what we are trying to do definitely is uh, trying to bring not only the best potential investors, uh, when, we, when I talked about attracting the top um, uh, investors, uh, like um, em emphasizing probably, I emphasize more construction companies, but we're also trying to attract a lot of O and M companies that have the technology um, for our projects. You no, know? and I mentioned the Titicaca waste water treatment plant, for example, the Lake Titicaca, as you know, is is the highest altitude lake in the world. We, we have it in in this in the eastern uh, southeastern part of Peru. It's a big blue chunk that we have in in Peru in the map, um, and it's a very emblematic project. Uh, and we have these three companies that are bidding for the project. And our terms of reference, and we're, what we're trying to do is attract someone that not only has the ability to construct it, because it's going to be 10 wastewater treatment plants around the lake to clean the lake. Uh, but so companies that don't not only have the, 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 the let's say the the background to construct the the wastewater treatment plants, but also the technology, the know-how to operate and man, man, maintain the, the the project, right? So. Definitely the technology thing, in our case, more, um, let's say, uh, directed to infrastructure is something that we're considering, trying to attract attract not only the best construction companies, but also the ones that can really give us a certainty that the service that is going to be provided in the next 30 years, because most of our P3's concessions are between 20 something to 30 years, so uh, that we can really have the, a guarantee that they're going to provide the best service to the population. So um, yeah, definitely technology is a must in our contracts and technology that is clean, that can really be sustainable, that can really support the environment and can really feel the population uh, safe, right? Thank you for that, Cesar. I think, uh, Jagat, I don't know, Jagat and James, um, if you would like to sort of uh, also give your perspectives on how you market your region. I mean, I think India is, is uh, you know, perhaps doesn't require a whole lot of explanation, but, um, you know, how do you market the region with all of the 
trends in technology moving so quickly? You know, I think from, from a London perspective, you, you know, we, you're right. I mean, how, how do you follow everything that's happening around the world? I mean, we are opening new offices around the world. I mean, we will have 13 by the time we finish opening the next few offices over the next month or so. I think we also work to, we, we, we do narrow our focus so we can focus on areas where, you, you know, London can provide opportunities to global companies. So not just to set up that sales and marketing office but to help companies you know, make Europe their true EMEA HQ and undertake development in, uh, in London and the UK. I mean, we also work closely with, with the national government and for example, uh, their industrial strategy, which has identified you know, AI and data, aging societies, clean growth, and uh, future of mobility as, as four uh, key areas where the UK can drive innovation and where the UK can bring uh, you know, forward thinking policy together with industry, both corporates uh, and uh, startups to, to make London and the UK uh, real centers of excellence. So I think understanding what, what the national government is doing, plus uh, you know, uh, and, and being focused on, on specific sectors where you know, we believe London can really become global leaders. I think that's one of, one of the ways in which we we, we really drive uh, drive new trends and uh, new technologies to to come to London, and then working with the national government to 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 identify areas of opportunity and, and drive that into into London. Really. Okay. So I think what I would do at this point, we we are getting close to ending time. But um, I would just remind uh, everyone uh, today that the San Diego Global Investment Forum uh, is happening on September 20th. Um, we invite you all to that. And uh, I'm sure Matt would be available to answer any questions about that after the fact. Um, but if there's any last bit of information or news, you would like to share about your regions um, or about your organization, um, please, uh, you know, just give us a, a few concluding remarks um, if you'd like to. So uh, I think, um, I, I don't know if Jagat is with us still, but uh, uh, why don't we start with um, uh, you, James, and then we'll, we'll go on from there. Well, thanks so much again for the opportunity to participate. So I think we found it a very interesting conversation and, and hearing what's happening around the world. It's very exciting. I think from a London perspective, you know, London continues to attract major international investment. I think, you know, we're expanding our presence globally. We're working in collaboration uh, with other cities and nations to ensure that, you know, we can drive international growth, not independently as one city, but really working together to to showcase opportunities around the world. And, and hopefully some of that will be through London. But I think the key message is that we're very eager to talk about the future of London and the fact that London is open and that we want to continue to collaborate. So, and thank you again. Thank you, thank you. Um, Cesar, why don't we go to you? Sure, uh, well, just, just to say what's a privilege, uh, again, to be in, in, in this platform, thanks uh, to the Global Chamber. Uh, I'm just to let you know again that well, Preinversion is working very hard to to bridge this infrastructure gap that we have. We're certainly a a core part of of of, of this um, with the P3 um, P3 projects. Again, we have a huge pipeline that we're trying to to increase in the next few years, um, and we're trying to work with the best in, in with the best stakeholders. Right, we're trying to attract the best. Uh, uh, equity investors, constructors, o and companies, um, uh, and we're also trying to attract the best advisors, again, because we want to really uh, emphasize on solidifying each and, and every one of the of the phases in, in, in the chain that I explained. So I'm, I'm more than happy to, if, if there's any question of, 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 of let's say, answering in, in the future, if you want to contact me, um, we will have a lot of projects, a very diversified platform. So again, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And um, Christine, if you wanted to say a few words. Uh, sure. Well, thanks again to the, the Global Chamber. It's been a great opportunity to, to be a part of this session. 
and learn about what's going on, you know, throughout uh, uh, the, the panelists' uh, initiatives. And um, I, I'd like to just reiterate that our organization is very happy to facilitate uh, finding trading partners, wherever the, the region may be, whoever is, um, has particular uh, FDI interests, um, through our connections, we'd be more than happy to, um, to facilitate the uh, introductions. Um, I suggested everyone look for me on LinkedIn, and then we can set up a, a private discussion and, and uh, zero in on your specific needs and uh, take things from there. Um, and we would hope you come to Hong Kong. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And uh, I think Jagat has probably left us, um, uh, but uh, we really appreciated his presentation and learning a little bit more about the Vibrant Summits. I'm sure he would be available to uh, talk with you all about what's happening in India um, uh, in that area. So thank you, Jagat, for joining us today. And Matt, I think we'll, we'll end with you and, and tell us a, a, your last little bit about San Diego. <laughs> okay, well, I will keep it uh, short and sweet. Uh, I invite anybody who would like to come, uh, like Kuntal says, to the mm -hmm. global investment event uh, on the 20th. It's at the Omni Hotel in beautiful downtown San Diego. We have about 40 speakers uh, across multiple disciplines and industries, uh, uh, including public, private, and civic people. Um, and uh, from the greater region, which is Tijuana, the global mega region in uh, Southern California. Um, you actually have, uh, as, uh, um, did you want me to give out the, the, your discount code, Kuntal? Do you want me to read that out? Uh, sh you, you know, I think what we'll do is maybe we'll send it to everyone afterwards okay. and um, just follow up uh, to everyone who registered and let them know that for Global Chamber members um, and, and partners, there is a discount code for the registration to the investment forum. So, so we'll be sure to get that out to everybody. Okay, super. Well, again, I, and I, like everyone else, appreciate um, the Global Chamber for all its efforts and for having me on today. So thank you. Thank you all so very much. Have a wonderful day wherever you are. Wonderful evening. And um, I think this was a really great conversation. Um, feel free to connect amongst yourselves after the fact. And thank you for joining us and have a great day.